Hey, I'm Chris Ralph, and today we're going to be talking about rare earth metals. Now, rare earths are something that a lot of people have never even heard of. And if you have heard of it, you probably don't know a lot about them. There's actually 17 of them, different rare earth metals. And we're going to talk about them all today. We're going to talk about um, how without rare earths, much of our modern technology would be totally gone. They would just disappear. Um, we're going to talk about how to prospect for these metals, about how they're extracted, um, you know, I did the, all the details, the importance of them and how China is in charge, and uh, the geology and deposits, mining and extraction, and finally at the end we'll get to prospecting for rare earth deposits that you could find and could be very profitable. Now, rare earth elements play a critical role, like I say, in so much of our modern technology. Here, let me show you a piece of rare earth metal. This is diprosium, one of the rare earth metals. It doesn't look like much, but without this metal, you wouldn't be able to have electric cars because this metal added to the magnets in the car that make the motor run, allow the magnets to remain strong even at warmer temperatures. Without the elements known as the rare earths, uh, computers would be like the size of a house still. And they were that size, you know, 70 and 80 years ago, but now they're small. We can fit them in our pocket. We could have a cell phone and, you know, this is more powerful than the computers of 75 years ago. But now we can have it in our hand. Now the other thing that uh, you get from rare earths, you wouldn't be able to have a color display. Nope. Rare earths make color possible in TVs and cell phones and the like, laptops and tablets. Without the rare earths you wouldn't have that. In fact, they have so much you know, green technology like uh, this rare earth magnet. If it wasn't for rare earth magnets like this, there would be no electric or hybrid cars. There would be no wind power or solar. So it, it, they have extreme importance in making our technology greener, lighter, faster, and smarter. And so they're critical and really important. Let me show you some information about how rare earths are used. This chart shows the uses of rare earth. You can see looking on the right hand side that catalysts and magnets are an extensive part of the usages, but also polishing, various miscellaneous applications, metallurgy, batteries, glass, ceramics, and phosphors and pigments uh, make up the rest of it. The phosphors and pigments is what uh, makes color screens possible for your TVs and cell phones and computers. In the inner circle is the producers, and you can see there that China has by far the, in a way, the bulk of that. Australia being only the only other significant producer. We're going to talk more about China as the world heavyweight power when it comes to producing rare earths. Now, originally, rare earths were used mostly in kind of traditional industrial kind of sectors, including metallurgy and petroleum refinement, textiles, agriculture. But in the last 60 years, the technology for rare earths has just grown and grown and grown. Um, as these new technologies have developed, we're creating a broad and expanding level of technology that uh, uses rare earths in chemical and catalytic, electrical, magnetic, and optical properties that we really need stuff that can do that. And the problem is there really is no substitutes for a lot of these applications. Like you could say, well, if we decided we didn't want rare earths anymore, we could just go use something else to do that. Yeah, there, there just isn't something else. That's why they're so critical. That's why rare earths are so important. Now, the rare earth elements, I told you there's 17 of them, and they're elements numbered from 57 to 71. Typically, they're uh, divided into two different categories, light rare earths and heavy rare earths. And I'm now going to try to pronounce, some of the names are weird and hard to pronounce, some of them are easy, but 
Some of them are really unusual, and I'm going to try and pronounce all of them for you. The two categories are first the light rare earths, and the light rare earths consist of lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, neodymium, samarium, and then the heavier, heavy rare earths consist of gadolinium, europium, terbium, diprosium, thulium, ytterbium, lutium, yttrium, holmium, and erbium. <laughs> now you can probably just forget all those names because uh, we're going to talk about them as a group. Not only do they occur as a group together, but uh, they're actually hard to separate the group. And in order to use all these different technological applications, it's actually very important that they be separated into individual elements. We're going to talk about that more. Now, some of these metals are fairly expensive, running from maybe about $5 a, a pound to perhaps $50 a pound in bulk types of quantities. I mean, you can't go down and buy a quarter of an ounce of a $50. That, that, that means you order it's $50 a pound, but you're ordering, you know, 10 tons of it or something like that. Because of their continued use in a wide array of different kinds of technologies and, and they're because they're so critical, the market for them has been growing and growing and growing and growing. Uh, the market for rare earths was estimated at $13.2 billion in 2019. And they're projecting that the that 13 billion will increase to 20 billion by 2026. It's a rate of growth, annual growth of about 11%. And rare earth elements will be critical in the growing shift to greener technologies. And the limitations on the availability of rare earths are already considered a significant barrier to the level of growth that we want to see in solar and wind and other green technologies. There's no doubt that the amount that we'll need is going to keep continuing to increase and that will probably drive prices to increase too. But the prices for rare earths, it's complicated. You see, the market for these metals is complicated because the entire world is slave to China. China produces currently about 85% of all the rare earths used across our entire planet. So if China says, hey, no, or we, we don't want to give you rare earths, you're in trouble. The rare earths are mined and processed in China where environmental regulations are lenient or ignored. Uh, and, and we're going to see in just a minute that mining and refining rare earths leads to huge amounts of toxic waste. The other th advantage that China has is that their labor rates are cheap. Most of the rare earths are extracted in open pit mines where there can be dust and, and actually there's almost always radioactive elements associated with rare earths even though the rare earths themselves are actually not radioactive. That just the minerals that they occur in, there's often small amounts of radioactivity or radioactive metals like especially thorium, associated with the minerals that have rare earths. At one time, a single mine in California, in the eastern deserts of Southern California, basically supplied the entire, or almost the entire world's needs for rare earth metals. And that seemed to work out fine for a while, but as the continued need, as these technologies developed, and the mine had issues and, and operating a mine in California became more and more and more difficult. Well, their production curtailed. Eventually they shut down and China said, thank you and took over. By the mid 1980s, that mine had closed and China became the dominant supplier of rare earths across the entire planet. Many expect the price of Chinese rare earths to continue climbing farther even than beyond the recent multi-year highs. This conclusion comes from uh, the anal analyzing of various statements from the government in China 
saying that uh, Beijing is thinking about weaponizing its rare earth production to control other nations in the various trade wars that China is experiencing with other nations. Back in about 2010, China decided to severely curtail and limit the rare earths that it was exporting. This was back, like I say, 20 or 10 plus years ago. And when they did that, the prices just skyrocketed and all the developed nations that really need the rare earths cried foul and, and uh, you know, objected, but China did what it wanted to do, which is raise the price. And the price, you know, started going up and sure enough, it attracted other people that were interested in rare earths. And China does not have the world's only rare earth deposits. Like I say, we used to supply the rare earth needs from a mine in California. But as the prices rose, more and more people got interested in prospecting for rare earths and a lot of deposits were found and some new mines got set to open up and it would eliminate China's, or at least their severe dominance. They would still be a big producer, but there would be other options for people who needed rare earths. Well, as soon as that China saw that that was happening, they put some more rare earths on the market and it dropped the prices down and uh, decreased the interest in rare earths quite a bit. The mine that was in California that once supplied the world, they had planned to reopen and they were getting going to go back into production. And when the prices dropped down, they couldn't meet their uh, loan payments and the company that was hoping to reopen the mine there went bankrupt. And a lot of other uh, people who were exploring for rare earths kind of put their projects on the shelf and said, okay, we're not gonna worry about rare earths anymore for a while because China's gonna go back to giving us what we need. Well, that's been 10 plus years ago. And now China is seeing that there's not a lot of other people producing rare earths. And so they have control again. They're in the driver's seat and they can raise prices until people start getting, well, we need to make some other options in the rare earth market. And then they'll lower prices again and put people out of business. That's just how a monopoly works. Although rare earth metals are critical in the technology that we use every day, Mining and processing these metals is extremely hazardous to the environment and it involves a lot of nasty ac acids and chemicals. It's estimated that something like 2,000 tons of toxic waste is produced for mining and refining one ton of rare earth metals. Other nations have begun efforts to try to mine and refine uh, rare earth metals in a more responsible, less toxic way, but the mining and extraction process is difficult and hazardous to the environment. So let's talk about the geologies, minerals and deposits. Now, the first thing that we wanna talk about with respect to rare earths is to say that, hey, they're not really that rare. Um, the, the trick of that is that while they're fairly common rare earths, they don't naturally concentrate into workable economic concentrations. That's what the whole point of looking for a deposit is. You find an area where natural processes of the earth have worked together to concentrate something valuable that you want into a small volume. That's what gold deposits and copper deposits, silver deposits, iron deposits, you know, whatever, you're talking about some natural geologic process that has managed to concentrate valuable materials into a lesser volume of rock. And that's what rare earths don't really do very well. You see the least abundant rare earths, the ones that are in smallest quantity are actually about a hundred times more common in the Earth's crust than gold. The more abundant rare earths, the ones of which there's lots of, are about 10,000 times more abundant in the Earth's crust than gold. There's a lot of metals like zinc or copper that are less abundant than rare earths, but we mine them in huge amounts because natural geologic processes will concentrate copper or zinc or other things, gold of course, into 
valuable concentrations that we can mine and extract and produce these useful products. So even though the rare earths are comparatively abundant in the earth's crust, they just don't often make into mineable economic concentrations that we can mine and work and extract valuable uh, minerals from. Uh, they they do it once in a while in a few places, but not very often for the amount of the material that's actually in the Earth's crust. Now, rare earth minerals are minerals that contain one or more of the rare earths as a major constituent, as a major part of what makes that mineral that mineral. There are more than 200 known and recognized rare earth minerals, but most of them are really rare. Um, rare earth minerals are usually found in association with a type of rock that's called pralkaline or alkaline types of igneous intrusions. These are rocks uh, like granite, you know, the, the, the kind of rock that you'd see, but with a little bit different chemistry. Um, they are found in pegmatites and alkaline magmas associated with things called carbonatite intrusives. Here's a picture of some carbonatite rock. So this is a piece of carbonatite. You can see it sort of kind of looks like granite with the sprinkled light and dark minerals. And they're coarse enough that you can see the individual grains. Carbonatites are a type of intrusive rock that uh, cools and solidifies below the Earth's surface. Uh, and, and they're formed by the melting of rocks that have been subducted down from the surface that are rich in carbonates like limestone or dolomite. And by going down into the earth during subduction, they get refractionated and enriched in rare earths. But they're very rare and unusual types of rocks. The most important rare earth minerals are basnesite and monzonite. Here, let me show you some basnesite and ore related pictures. Here's a specimen from the Mountain Pass mine in the deserts of Southeast California that once supplied the whole world with rare earths. The brownish, orangish kind of colored clots in the rock are the rare earth mineral basnesite. Here's an individual crystal of the same mineral basnesite, and this is from Pakistan. Here's some more crystals of that same mineral basnesite, little individual crystals, also from Pakistan. Basnesite and such deposits like this with carbonatites are found in China and the United States and a few other places, but that's the most common. And they constitute the largest percentage of the world's rare earth resources. Monazite is a, uh, another rare earth mineral and it commonly mined in heavy sands. And heavy sand deposits with monazite are found in Australia, Brazil, China, India, Malaysia, South Africa, Sri Lanka, and China, and also in the United States. They constitute the second largest percentage of known rare earth resources. Here are some pictures of monazite showing you what it looks like. Here's some monazite on a rock, but it's not the dark colored material you see. You have to look close. There's some orangey brown spots in between there. That's the monazite. Here's a single crystal of monazite. It's kind of an orangey brown color, but this is what the monazite actually looks like as it's mined. It's a heavy sand that when uh, they mine sand and concentrate it down, they get a heavy black sand and then they use magnets to pull out the iron and you're left with this uh, orangey yellow kind of sand which is mostly monazite. Some less common rare earth minerals include alanite and xenotime and some rare earth bearing ion absorption clays. Here's some pictures of alanite and xenotime. This is alanite. It's a rare earth mineral that's common sometimes in pegmatites. It really doesn't produce any significant amount of rare earths for the commercial market, but it's kind of a collector's stone. And this is a crystal of xenotime, again another rare earth mineral that really doesn't produce a lot of rare earths for the commercial market. So let's talk about the geologic environments that you might find 
a rare earth deposit located in. The first of these is the residual or ion absorption type uh, deposit. Rare earth elements uh, are found, like I say, in small amounts in lots of different kinds of rocks. And if the kinds of rocks are weathered and decomposed the right way, you know, I, when I did my video on aluminum, I talked about how aluminum deposits are formed by the weathering of rocks on the surface. Same thing can happen for rare earths if you have just the right kind of rock. Basically, if you have a rock that decomposes into certain types of clays, then when the weathering occurs and the rare earth elements are leached out into that broken up and decomposed rock, the layers beneath may absorb rare earth elements and they can actually form valuable concentrations. There's not a lot of these kinds of deposits, but there's some in China and elsewhere. This is a relatively new type of deposit. It's only really been recognized since the 1980s, and uh, there are known deposits like this in China and in Kazakhstan, uh, but they're still looking for them in different places. When you have the right kind of rocks that form these ion clays that will hold on to the rare earth elements and they're not really well understood so more will be known on these in the future and there's probably some out there that haven't been discovered then the next kind of deposit that i want to talk about is the alkaline igneous type which is the uh, i mentioned before these special types of rocks that are rich in carbonates and uh, sometimes called carbonatites it's basically a carbonate rock that's gone down, it's been refractionated, it's in, under super pressure and heated, it kind of melts, and then as it comes closer to the surface and cools off, it forms these carbonatites, and they're almost always enriched somewhat in rare earth metals. The mine that supplied most of the world's supply in the southeastern California desert yeah, that's that mountain pass, and let me show you some pictures of the mine right now. It belongs to this type of rock, the carbonatites. That's what the deposit there is. This is that mine in Southern California that once supplied most of the world's needs for rare earths for many decades, but has been shut down quite a bit. You can see the pit right in the center of the picture, and all the buildings around there are the buildings for processing and extracting the rare earths from the ore. The carbonatite rocks are composed mostly of carbonate and phosphate minerals. And that's, you know, stuff that's derived from sedimentary rock that's been uh, basically pushed down deep into the earth, heated and partially melted, and then eventually making its way back up to the surface. But these kind of rocks are rare and there are actually only 500, a little more than 500 examples of carbonatite known in the world by geologists. And we've been looking for them for decades. So they're not very uh, common and occur only in certain kinds of places. Now the next most productive and largest resource of rare earth elements I mentioned is in uh, placer deposits. Now when rocks that have a little bit of rare earths in them, they may only have small amounts, but because like I say, the rare earth elements don't fit into normal rock bearing minerals, they get concentrated down and they uh, form into normally into a mineral called monazite. And this mineral is a very resistant to weathering. It's not broken down very easily. They often start as little small particles that are just a small percentage of the total rock that they come from. And they weather and they go through streams as sand and eventually a lot of times make it out to beaches on oceans or lakes. And the process of erosion decomposes some kinds of minerals and concentrates these heavy minerals that are resistant to weathering. There's actually some placer deposits, some gold deposits in the United States, in Idaho, that have a lot of monazite in the gravels that are with them. It's very common that a lot of different kinds of placer deposits will have a little monazite with them, but only in certain ones that are mined in beaches and different places, and I mentioned some of these countries earlier, they have 
concentrations of these heavy mineral deposit sands and the sands are often mined for other things like zirconium and sometimes other different elements and that sort of thing but they produce this monazite as a byproduct but the extraction of the rare earths from them is difficult and it often produces this thorium radioactive byproduct that nobody wants we actually have an operation in florida in the united states that mines this material and the monazite that they produce because it's so difficult to process and it has this radioactive waste when they produce it they just put it back in the ground and bury it they don't extract the rare earths they don't extract anything else and because it's a natural product and they put the natural product back in the ground it's not a hazardous waste another source a very small source is pegmatites a lot of pegmatites have a mineral called alanite and some other minerals in them that may contain rare earths because again i mentioned that rare earth elements don't fit into normal rock forming minerals and pegmatites actually are a concentration of elements that don't fit into normal rock bearing minerals and so you get in pegmatites minerals like aquamarine beryl or tourmaline which is a boron silicate or you get some minerals that have rare earths in them just depending on what the chemistry of the magma that was solidifying and the last little bit that didn't fit in with the other minerals the last little bit was left formed into a pegmatite and pegmatites have very coarse grains in them uh, they have a lot of unusual minerals and but the, the pegmatites are not a significant source of rare earths usually the pegmatite it's a very small percentage of the pegmatite that has rare earths and so it's not an important source Re mostly pegmatites are more interested interest usually pegmatites are more interesting to mineral collectors because they have coarse big well-formed crystals and minerals and so it's not a commercial source of rare earths there are some other types uh, lesser understood and still working on it types of things where we're discovering more and more places where we can find at least some amounts of rare earths one of these is the iron oxide copper gold deposit that's a type of deposit and if you go back to my copper prospecting video i have a discussion of this uh, iron oxide copper gold type deposit and how they form some marine phosphate deposits and we mine quite a few of these in uh in florida and of course elsewhere in the world they're an important source of phosphate for fertilizers some of these can have significant amounts of rare earths in them but uh, they're still working on how to get the rare earth oxides out of this type of rock economically another unusual type of rare earth deposit is found in texas there's a small hill in the far western part of texas called round top and it's being explored for lithium beryllium and rare earths i'll show you a picture this type of deposit occurs in a rhyolite dome these types of rhyolite domes are not all that unusual in many parts of the western u.s there's quite a few of them and some of them are actually associated with gold silver deposits as well this type of rock is unusual it's it's the rare earths are in low levels throughout the rock there's not concentrations of veins or something like that in the rock that have most of the rare earths in them and they're still working on techniques to try and extract this but you know beryllium lithium and rare earths are all quite valuable and so if they can figure out an economic way to get the valuable metals out of the rock it may be a worthwhile kind of deposit one of the difficult things about rare earth deposits and getting them the metals out of it is that no two deposits are the same i like i just mentioned they're still working on getting the the valuable rare earths out of some different kinds of ore where they know that there's rare earth elements in the rock but they're still working on how to get those out economically without creating massive quantities of toxic waste and it, like every deposit is different in its own way and has its own kind of unique features so there's not just one process oh well you found a rare earth deposit well do xyz and that'll get the the rare earths out of it there's just nothing like that so 
every rare earth deposit it's like a chemical research project well, how do you extract these things and get them out and purify them and make a usable sellable product so let's finally talk about prospecting for rare earths and how you might go out and find a rare earth deposit that might be valuable that maybe you'll be able to sell to somebody um, certainly when the Chinese cut supplies a decade plus ago, man, it spurred rare earth prospecting all over the world, including, of course, the United States. And we found some. Let me show you some resources that are known in the United States for rare earths. This is a map that shows the rare earth resources in the United States. And you can see that there are um, a number of carbonatite red dots there in New Mexico and Southern Colorado and then also in southeastern California there's a couple of dots including the one uh, mountain pass that's right next to the Nevada border there are also a couple way up north on the panhandle of southeastern Alaska the yellow areas are areas of monazite uh, sands including the one up there in Idaho that's really rather large but even the ones in the Carolinas and Florida are quite productive. This gives you an idea of places that could be searched for rare earth minerals. Now, the carbonatite types, uh, they're fairly well known, and there's some of them in the United States, but probably the best opportunity for searching for rare earths in the U.S. is searching for things that are little known and little understood. This would include like the Texas uh, rhyolite dome type. There's zillions of rhyolite domes around the West. And while most of them I'm sure don't have any significant rare earths, there probably are some of them that do. And it may be worth testing some of them to see. Again, it has to figure out, you have to figure out how to get the rare earths out. Um, so, you just have to search around the Texas uh, rhyolite dome types, some of the ion adsorption clays. They're older rocks that have uh, weathered deeply, may have some valuable rare earths, and there are productive rare earth mines that produce from these ion clays. And then carbonatites. Uh, you can see that there are significant ones in uh, Colorado and New Mexico and some other places. Searching for these may be productive also. So when, when prospecting, my recommendation is basically unusual types, knowing how rare earth metals are deposited, and looking for things that people haven't already looked for. Now, prospecting is kind of the core of my uh, prospecting channel, and I mostly talk about prospecting for gold. Now the next thing we're going to talk about in this series is we're going to talk about lithium. We're going to talk about the same kinds of things here, mining and minerals and prospecting. Lithium has been just a really big thing in recent years and some people have made some big money prospecting for lithium deposits, especially here in my home state of Nevada. Now, most of my prospecting videos, though, are about prospecting for gold. And I go out and do a lot of interesting things, and i got a lot of plans coming up for 2021. And if you want to be able to gain the skill of being able to go out and find gold for yourself, it, it really is a skill like learning to be an electrician or learning to be a plumber or some other trade that you learn, you know how to do it, and you can go out and exercise that. And the same thing is true with gold. It's just walking out someplace, the gold doesn't leap out of the ground and jump into your pocket. You have to know what you're doing. And to learn how to do that, I wrote a book, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about my book on prospecting for gold right now. So let me tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, it's called Fistful of Gold, and I wrote it because I want you to be able to go out and find for yourself this full of gold and uh, you can see that it's a, an encyclopedia with all kinds of information pictures and that sort of thing it's not in color but uh, uh, color would have cost me a lot more to have printed and so the book would have cost a lot more it's for sale on Amazon and you can pick it up I'll put a link in the description below I also serve as the editor for a, a prospecting magazine it's icmj's prospecting and mining journal and honestly you should check that out we've got stories 
uh, and information, legal stuff, everything you know to increase your skills as a prospector. I write articles in this every month and a lot of other very experienced prospectors contribute to the magazine as well. So check the magazine out. Also, I have a website and the website is uh, at nevadaoutbackgems.com. I'll put a link for it in the description below, but there's gobs of information there that you will find useful in your prospecting efforts. Finally, I want to say that I really appreciate your comments and thoughts and even a positive criticism. Don't come on there and just toss out insults because I'll just delete your comments. But if you've got uh, helpful things to say and questions to ask, do write and, and put those in the comments because I answer my comments to people and uh, you'll hear from me in, in, you know, in, in responding to you. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this video and you like what you see and you're interested in uh, finding out more, well then sign up, subscribe, and hit the, uh, the notification bell so they'll let you know when I post new videos. And, you know, like it and share it if, again, you, you see stuff that you really are excited about. And I'll be coming out with lots more new videos. And so we'll see you again real soon.